let's just get right into it. I'm going to talk about the Fed because more and more increasingly so, the market and the Fed are basically becoming synonymous, simpatico. Um, so I took some notes. Um, there's a lot, but I'll go through them pretty quickly and I'll try and make sense out of what Janet Yellen said. Then we'll get into the market levels, particularly in the S&P 500. And I will talk about some of the um, tickers that you guys wanted to, and stuff you wanted me to talk about. A lot of them I was planning on talking about anyway, so that works out. So for, for me, I often talk about how you, from being right to wrong, there's a subtle step in between, and that's you have to first stop being right to be wrong, or first stop being wrong to be right. And Janet Yellen, in her last speech, um, which was, when was the last uh, Yellen presser? That was on 412, I want to say. So that, to me, was a bit of a game changer, where she took back all of the Fed hawkishness and, and turned very dovish. And I would say that this was, for the most part, a replay of her concerns there, maybe even she went further on some of the concerns today. So she said there was no balance um, of the risk, which means to me that she was still erring on the side of dovishness and not going to neutral before becoming hawkish. A lot of people, and it's amazing to me, and I talked about this um, for the last few weeks, that I think the market had just overly discounted the Fed and that I expected there to be a bit of a snapback. We talked about that. The snapback happened so late that it become, became super violent. And that is actually the exact same thing that's happening now with the VIX and Brexit. We're going to get to that in... Let me write that down on my list because I, if I forget to mention the Brexit, it would probably be unconscionable, right? You guys will hate me and... and then I probably might not have 19,000 followers anymore. I might have like, you know, five. <laughs> anyway, um, so she didn't switch to neutral. She's still airing on dovish, which is good. I think the media doesn't really understand that. Believe it or not, that's a very hard concept for people to understand. That subtle switch, it's sort of from being wrong to right and from being dove, dovish to neutral to hawkish. So she is still dovish. There was no switch ever no matter what the media will tell you. I understand all of these Fed heads like to pop off and run, you know, talk, talk tough about rate hikes. The point, though, and, and I believe, honestly, every single one of them other than Janet Yellen and I guess Dudley just because he's the New York Fed and you always have to pay attention to the New York Fed. But other than those two, I would say, and, and believe me, I'm on thin ice with Dudley with some of his statements lately, um, you can now fully discount them. I believe they have all blown their credibility. They have proven to be quite incompetent. Um, my sum total of the Fed today could be a little bit alarming to some of you, and we'll get to, get to that. Um, Janet Yellen basically um, lowered her interest, the outlook for rate hikes in 20... She basically said that they're going to do one this year. I believe that'll be the ceremonial one on this, in December. Just to show that there's a pulse, we'll see if things get really cray. That might not even happen. They lowered their economic and their rate hike outlook for 2016 and 27, sorry, 2017 and 2018, which goes back to the hashtag that I invented, which I heard quite a bit bandied about today. I really wish I was collecting royalties on that because then I wouldn't have to trade and I'd be super duper wealthy. Lower for longer. I've seen a lot of people put in the letter F, they spell out for. But the real way to do it is lower the number four and then longer, because that's just how we do it in BK here. Um, yeah, so lower for longer is in full effect here. Um, she talked about a mixed economy, uh, and she talked about the l slower labor market. This is, this is just in the Fed Minute release. I haven't even gotten into her statement yet. Um, consumer spending... Um, they said was a bit strong, but we're a bunch of junkies anyway, right? We'll spend everything we have today and not worry about tomorrow. So I don't really go too much into that. The only time you really see that changing is when you're in deep, deep into kind of a uh, economic downturn. Um, she talked about business investment being soft. No surprise there. Those of you who have followed me and I've been talking about the hindrance on business with um, 
policy and with the Obamacare tax, uh, there's a lot. Of, there's not a lot of visibility for businesses. They don't know what's coming, particularly with a new administration coming. There will be very big differences between a Clinton and a uh, and a Trump administration. So I believe that that is going to stay the stay status quo at least through the balance of the year and probably another year after that because people kind of have to get their feet wet and see what's going on with the new administration. Policy doesn't just switch overnight. Um, then she talked about they expect inflation to be rising to their target. I guess they feel a little bit better now that oil is in, in full crash mode, although it's been down quite a bit the last few days. Uh, now we're going to get into Yellen's um, comments. This was ju- that was just the run-of-the-mill um, Fed. Those were my notes from the Fed release. She talks about mixed indicators, which to me means more stagnation and more contemplation. At one point, she even was talking about academics. You know, it, it was just kind of comical to listen to some of the stuff that was coming out of her mouth. Um, they, she, they said they're not on a preset course, which wants to get, which gives them flexibility to kind of back slowly out of the room um, of the rate hike camp because they were starting to switch into hawkish mode in December with that really foolish rate hike into the teeth of a slowdown. So they're backing away from that. Um, they talked, she talked about weaker growth. The GDP numbers we know have been terrible. Uh, soft exports, uh, yeah, obviously that's been a problem with the, with the stronger dollar. Um, I, that is mitigated to some degree, but I don't think we're out of the woods with that quite yet. I'll talk about the dollar in a little while. Um, weaker foreign demand, of course, that's always the case if uh, they can buy cheaper from another country as a result of the strong dollar plus some of these emerging you know these economies around the world have not been doing well uh, the impl- unemployment rates in these countries are quite high and i don't see that changing any time we'll get into the um, my view about the structural problems in the country and the world in a moment uh, they, they she did talk about being afraid of the strong dollar um, she talked about acknowledge the energy slowdown with businesses and so on and so forth um, business investment we talked about, I, I said, was weak, and a lot of that is because of the regulations and taxes. How, slowing household spending in Q1. The first quarter for the last two, now three years, has been notoriously weak, so this should be no surprise to anyone. It just seems to be a new norm. Uh, she did say it improved a little in Q2 and sees it improving still further in the next few years. Um, all right, I mean, if she knows something, I, I don't think she really knows. I think she's just guessing. Um, slow pace of job growth, um, and it, she said it was slowing year over year, and recently it got a lot worse. So when things stop going up, they usually start slowing before having a downturn. So the rate of change of job improvement, you know, the last the last number was supposed to be big. Uh, I mean, 160,000, and it was 38,000, and that was on the back of a miss. And and now we have revisions to the prior readings. So the rate of change of job growth is slowing, and it would not surprise me, believe it or not, to see it go negative at some point. I haven't heard anyone else call for that, but you are hearing it here first. That is quite cutting edge, isn't it? Um, So yeah, we're probably going to grind to a slow halt in the job growth. Uh, You know my thesis on that with artificial intelligence and automation taking over, particularly with company, or I mean workers pressing for higher wages. The, as you raise the minimum wage, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to implement machines. Um, if you have to pay health care, higher minimum wages, and more benefits, um, running a machine is a hell of a lot cheaper. That type of technology has not been available in the past and is only becoming better and more readily available and cheaper as it gets more advanced. Think about how much computers were initially and then how much they are now. You know, and back in the day, only very wealthy people had, or corporations had computers, then it was the very wealthy, and now it's everybody. I mean, you could go into a Best Buy and buy a Windows machine that was like, would blow away anything from like the last 10 years for like maybe under $600. So, you know, putting in terminals instead of cashiers, putting in machines instead of workers. This is going to be the norm, and I believe it's going to start in the blue-collar jobs, but I also believe, and again, I've never heard anyone else call for this, I believe it's going to get into the white-collar jobs too, and that is going to be a disaster. 
um, for average and median incomes and so on and so forth. So we'll talk about that because of the skew that comes from higher incomes. Don't want to get into that today, but it will be a theme going forward. Um, slope, I talked about the job growth, um, got worse. Average hourly earnings, they, um, they picked up a little bit. Um, I believe a lot of that, though, was because of the minimum wage increases. More of companies are adopting that. So I think the Fed is sort of taking credit for something or seeing something that might not really be there. It could be kind of the mirage in the desert. Um, I think a lot of that is from the, um, uh, from the minimum wage increases. <sighs> Uh, all right, so this was, an, this was another big one, I think, that was lost on the press. I don't know if this will ever be picked up, but you will hear it here. Um, they said not to overreact to one or two reports. I think that people talk, took that as don't overreact to bad reports, but I really believe they mean they don't want to overreact to good reports because if something, it's a false dawn. If they see a report of a hot jobs number or a hot inflation number, they need confirmation. So they want to see more than one or two they look for a trend. We have definitely not had that. We have had those spikes, and that's gotten them, everyone all, you know, their panties in a bunch, so to speak. But the truth is, is that things really aren't better other than a, I guess, brief interludes of spikes. I have a theory about this. Um, I've thought this for quite some time. I still think it's the case, and it gets proved to me more and more with every earnings cycle. I think that we're in a period where we don't have inventory recessions in the sense that we used to. Like that's how big market tops or big, I, should say, I shouldn't say market because it really doesn't have to do with the market. It really has to do with the economy. Um, inventory recessions where companies think business is doing well, they overstock and then they have to blow out their inventory. With computers and technology and real time um, supply chain management, it's, it, you can still have it, don't get me wrong, but it's not to the same degree and across the entire economy like it might have been in the past. So what I think we're in is we're caught in this cycle of replenishment and you know then it kind of dwindles away and then they replenish and it dwindles away. So I think it's just a restocking cycle that gets everyone excited. They think that the business cycle is really turning, like things are getting better, but it's really just a restocking cycle that we're in. Again, that's something that you won't hear anywhere else. That's a proprietary uh, theory of mine. I don't even know if I've talked about that before, but it is something I talk about quite often, particularly after one or two Manhattans. Um, alrighty, so by the way, you think these periscopes are entertaining. You should see what I'm out with my friends, the ones that are interested in this. We have a hell of a time talking about this stuff. Alrighty, um, personal consumption expenditures slow for... Um, from energy and imports. So this is a measure now that the Fed is injecting into the mix. Personal, expendi um, personal consumption expenditures, so we have to keep an eye on that. They have not been good, which is good for the lower for a longer thesis. Um, core inflation, they talked about 1.5% going to 2% over two to three years. I don't even know what they're doing talking about raising interest rates until they even get close to their inflation targets. So it just seems like a lot of tough talk to me. The, again, the bluster, it makes make no sense to me for them to start hiking. The reason for interest rate hikes, by the way, are for overheating economies or for rampant inflation. They can't even meet their inflation targets and the jobs numbers and the GDP are in the shitter, in the, in the tank. So... Um, yeah, so I don't understand why they would even be even be entertaining the idea of raising hikes. They should probably be talking about just let's forget about that. You know, earmuffs, earmuffs. Um, I don't even know why they'd be entertaining. They, sh they should be talking really about more QE, if anything. So that to me just it, it just makes that has not made sense to me in quite some time. So how does that affect the? Um, w what do we need to look at here? One, a couple of disturbing things to, um, happened. I, I would say that the um, oil is pulling back. You have now today for the first time broken the channel, which means um, this is after, let's see, we have one, that was the reversal day of one, two, three, four, five days of selling. In the past, we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine in the cycle. So we might only be a little bit halfway through here. 
I'm looking I've been looking for a retest I was looking for a channel retest here which is what we got and we're a little bit below we'll have to see you have now basically two days so if you could get like let's say tomorrow is an update and you took out today's high of day and the two-day high of day I would say today was more of a false breakdown um, it wouldn't surprise me just to see a 50-day moving average test that would be down in like the 45s that was sort of the um, the last big support level was in the 45. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. I talked, by the way, about oil being bullish from 49 to about 52, where I thought it would top out. We topped out at 51.67. So it shouldn't really be a surprise that um, we're getting a bit of a pullback here. Um, if we do a fit, the, the only issue here and the um, one concern I have is that we're kind of a long way, I use this term when we get far away from Fibonacci levels, we're a long way from Kansas, Toto. 50% um, Fib would be down at 38 and a 61.8 is 35. So there's not going to be much Fib support for us here. I do, however, think that the 50 should be a near-term support and more importantly the 200. I don't know where we'll be when we get to that. It's currently in the 40s. Um, there's a lot, but there's a lot of levels here: 43s, 45s. I think that we're going to stall a little in there and find a little bit of support in there before anything more serious. The gauge I've been using for the oil to see if the pullbacks are more real or not has been Exxon. It's been holding up near its sort of like channel range high, like a boss. It's still above the 100, 100 in the and the 20, no, I'm sorry, the 10 and the 20, the 50 comes in at 88, and the 100 is now almost at 85. The 200 is down in 81. So, uh, you know, I, I think at the really the worst of this, you might get, if there was a really larger market pullback, you could probably see this thing down in 83s or 85s, but there's a lot of levels down there, and I wouldn't start really getting crazy bearish on oil until you take out 87.61. Write that down. That's a key level. That was the last swing pivot, um, sorry, swing low pivot between the recent two highs, and you it's actually below the 50 MA. So if we started taking that out, I would start reassessing my um, condition on, on the oil sector as a whole. Um, XLE, I think a lot of people miss this. This also doesn't, to me, look super duper terrible. You have a fifth that's still above trend, although you kind of snap the near term trend, but the larger trend, you're still kind of a little intact. And that really comes into play at the edge of the volume distribution. So 65s, mid 65s, and you also have the 50 there. If that were to snap, I would be a big fan of put ratios, by the way, for a play down to the 200 MA. The 200 MA has been like grim death for, for XLE for a long time. It should now be support. Um, and it, not only should it be support, it should be big time support. We haven't had a retest. We got close, but we haven't had a retest. It, so if you want to play bearish for XLE, I like put ratios like buying higher and then selling two times out of the money. Um, I usually tend to like those um, for for XLE. You could also do some flies where you buy some you know buy some puts, sell two times out of the money, and then buy another one below to cap off the margin requirements. So that's my view on oil and how I would be playing some of these um, plays with XLE uh, and Exxon and so on and so forth. Alrighty. So did we cover that? Wasn't really on here, but I interjected it. The dollar, so this is really a key, a key factor here. The dollar really should have been down more today on the Fed kind of dovishness, but I think that the fears of the Brexit and the potential contagion into the euro is keeping a bid in the dollar. You also have a lot of people loading up on treasuries. These are all people in these foreign countries who have no faith in their banking system. Deutsche Bank seems to make a new low every day. It, all, a lot of these banks don't have FDIC and deposit insurance, and a lot of people are worried about being greased, where they wake up one day and they can't get their money out of the banks. So they stop worrying about a return of their, on their capital and worry about a return of their capital. That's why you see the German bunds at negative interest rates, because they can buy them and their money is insured then by the German government. Same thing with U.S. Treasuries. 
U.S. Treasuries, as expensive as they are and as low as they're yielding, they still have a positive yield. So you can have an arbitrage where you do something like you short the German bonds and you buy U.S. Treasuries. That to me would make uh, make you know a lot of make a lot of sense if you're playing that game. Uh, the dollar has a two-day range that is roughly equal. Uh, if you break the high of day, you can play to the long side. If you break the low of day, you can play to the short side. Keep it simple, stupid. Today's range is always key. Everybody who's been following me for a while knows I am a big, big fan of Fed day ranges. Unfortunately, we didn't have a large one, um, a really large. Actually, I guess you could say, fortunately, we don't have a large one so that you, if you want to play row row against the, the extremes, there was not a big range to get stopped out in, so that actually could be fuel to the fire in either direction. I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, TL, you, so I, I was talking about the the dollar. So UUP has been the one I've been using, the proxy. We are still below the regression line today, though. Looks like it retested the backside of the up the the old downtrend and then bounced. It did close below yesterday's low, so it's not really as def it's not really definitive again the same thing if you were to get above the hammer high today tomorrow you can probably play you know a right or right out play to the long side and use the i don't necessarily think you need to use the wick of today's um of today like the, the below the low of day as a stop um, I think you could use the body range in that. So if you go into a chart, I don't want to get too wonky with this. If you go take a look at the chart, I think it's like 2453-ish or so, 24 half on the UUP. Um, below there to me would be more vulnerable. Above there still remains a little, like there could be a little bit more rally in its bones. Um, all right, so that covers the dollar. The TLT today looked a little double toppy. It closed a little better than it looked on the lows, but not looking... I mean, this just has run, I think, so much. A lot of the last few days have felt very forced to the upside. Um, I, I guess you can just use the two-day low. I'd be interested if this broke the two-day low tomorrow as a short. I'm not really that interested in playing this long right now until there's a pullback, because that, to me, would feel like chasing. So I'd be looking maybe for a pullback play, and I'd be... I, I had been bullish on this, by the way, but I, I don't want to be a chaser. I do think that there's room to the old all-time high at 138.5 and potentially the channel high, which is close to 141 right now. That could very much happen, but I would be more inclined to buy this on a, um, on a dip than I am to chase right at the highs. That's just the way I'm built. If I miss that run, you know, if I were today putting the trade on, if I miss that run, you know, you miss it. Sometimes you just you can't catch them all. For me, it's all a matter of trade location, and to play something that's had multiple day a multiple day run, it just to me, you know, I, I'd rather buy it on on some type of a pullback. Um, Germany again, I, I think I discussed that they, they they are definitely pressing the heck out of that yield. It's went negative. I I think that that will eventually set up to be the short of a lifetime. I, I just don't see the eff efficacy from any manager, how they can, with a straight face, talk to clients and say they're now first buying German bunds. I'd rather them say that they were buying uh, U.S. Treasuries. At least there's some type of a yield there. So I don't expect that situation in the, in the German bonds to last terribly long. Um, it could last longer than people think, but I don't necessarily think it's going to last forever. Um, I'd be more inclined to wait for some type of a blow-off spike in that. And I think the um, the problem for the ETF is Bunnell, B-U-N-L. Today you actually um, got it. This is really looking super toppy here. Um, I'm, actually, I'm actually sorry I didn't try pepper in a short today near the high. I was going to do it yesterday, but I was waiting for a little bit more. And today I just got a little bit, I forgot about it. But if there's any more spikes in this, I think that there will be some type of a short to be played in that. Um, all right, so that's Germany. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the precious metals markets. Uh, since about 14, I've been long in, yeah, right around the gap. Um, I've been long in SLV. I'm planning on holding that for a while. I have good trade location. I think that it's um, likely going higher. Uh, again, this is something that 
you know, was it has been a bit of a gap and go. I, if you want to play it, I, I'm fine with playing long, but you know, you might want to wait for a little bit of a dip. Although I do think that this is the path of least resistance seems to be higher. Um, gold is very close to a breakout here, um, over 123.96 would be the breakout. The only issue I have is there's a backside of an old uptrend line a little bit higher, so everyone might be chasing this thing into the 124s and 125s, and that might actually be a little bit of a sell point. Why? Because it came up, um, there's a term a, a buddy of mine uses, a com coming up from the bottom, meaning it's, it's run so much already that the breakout isn't as good as if it consolidated. Like if you had a few days here of consolidation to the side and then it went, then I think you can chase it higher. Now I'd be more looking for the break to um, suck in new late longs and looking to kind of um, book some profits. So gold looks like it wants higher, but I don't know how much higher short term. It might be a bit of a, a move up and then fall back a little bit. Um, gold tends to like to, to do things like that. The VIX, that's another big risk gauge. All right, so here's the skinny with the VIX. Uh, it had been in a range where it was trying to punch into an old potential up channel and was failing. We are in there. It, it, it closed actually today fairly, um, it closed negatively, but it closed a little bit strong. We'll have to see how that plays out in the next few days. There's a downtrend a little bit higher up in the, like the 24s, close to 25s. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see that happen if we get into Brexit. I also could see this just chopping for a little bit. I think that the problem was is that volatility, like what happened with the Treasury expectations for rate hikes, it was priced out so badly that nobody thought it was happen, happening until it got priced in and then it had a huge spike. I think the same thing is happening with the VIX. There was so much complacency and so lack of fear going into the Fed and the Brexit because the polls initially with Brexit had been that it wasn't happening, that now there's like sort of a rush to protect and it's overcompensating for um, lack of planning. That just seems to be the case in Wall Street. So um, I think that that's why there hasn't been like a super duper mass sell off in the market. I mean, the market's been down, but um, I think that that's really what's going on here with the VIX, that it's just in a bit of a period of an upswing, and it's because of an overcompensation from lack of fear leading into this, uh, into this Brexit, and all of a sudden people woke up and were like, yeah, we need to do that. So here's the deal with the Brexit. Um, how will this impact the market? Um, how will this impact the economy? The answer is, I think that nobody really knows how this is going to Im impact the economy. I don't necessarily think that it will hurt the U.S. economy tremendously because we don't tend to sell a lot of stuff to Europe. They tend to sell a lot of stuff to us. Think Germany and BMWs and Mercedes and cars. I am on the fence with how this should go. I, I believe they should leave. I think the European Union has been a disaster since the beginning. I've never understood how you link monetary policies without linking governments. They never did that. Each of these countries have such different issues and such different problems and national pride um, issues. It never made sense to me that it would, it would go that way. Whether or not they will leave is another story. Um, I know that there have been a lot of polls that say that they're going to leave. I don't necessarily believe those polls. Um, there's some betting bookies or whatever in, Engl in England, and the, the, it's still not favoring the le them leaving. It seems to me also that the European Union would really have a, a be under a lot. The fear, of course, everyone always assumes the end product. If England leaves, then France will leave, and Spain will leave, or, you know, it's like a, be a domino effect. I don't really think that that's going to really be the case. I, I, it just doesn't seem like to me that the, it always seems like people get their fears worked up. I think also the fact that like Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse, all these stocks have been down a lot. I think that really is not so much of a function of their credit problems, but it's more a function of the low interest rate environment. 
Banks can't make money with negative rates. You know, they need to borrow cheap and lend expensive, and they can't lend anything. I mean, lend out expensive because rates are so low. You have a 10-year yield, you know, with a negative rate. So I just think it's hard for them to make money in those businesses, and that's a problem here also. That's why the financials have so badly underperformed because they've been regulated into oblivion, and they've had a very hard time with... Um, with the yield curve. They're basically say all savings and loans now and making money on fees. That's really how they make their money. That's why uh, there's all these overdraft fees and whatever, you know, account, account maintenance fees and so on and so forth, because that's the only way they can make the bucks. They don't have the proprietary markets like they, they used to have. That's been taken away from them. I've always maintained it's better to buy the insurance companies for a rate hike play than it is the banks. Um, travelers being the uh, the best one in town. Their chart seems to be the best of of, of the best there. Um, Apple today was a bit of an early tell. It um, kind of gave up the ghost a little bit. I, I think the problem for Apple, and I mentioned this in a tweet the other day. I was watching the um, Worldwide Developer Conference, and I was thinking about about what Apple's woes have been, and I think it's just that Tim Cook is boring. The guy is just a bore. I remember when Steve Jobs used to come on, I would be excited. I couldn't wait to see what this guy was going to you know, present. I, I just can't wait for Tim Cook to be done. The guy is just, he's a great manager. He's a supply chain manager. He's a competent executive, but he's a bore. So I think the yeah, Tim Cook, I mean, it seems to me that they just keep perfecting their products, and they do make great products. You should see my house over here. I have so much Apple product. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's it's insane. I have a, the 5K iMac. I'm on an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have a MacBook. I, I, I mean, a MacBook Pro. I mean, I have, and God knows how many iPods over the years. I haven't bought the watch yet, but I believe I'm going to get the second generation. I've been waiting for that. Um, I think the issue for me with Apple is that they need to show, and I do think payments and gaming could be a big deal for them, and a streaming service would be smart. The problem is, is that the products they've been making, their software, has not been really that inspiring. It's just been iterations, and they always seem to be behind playing catch up to Android. There's no real innovation there. And the new music app that they came out with, I mean, I know they have a redesign in, in 10. They, that they said they built again from the ground up, that only tells me that the last one was a complete failure. That music app is a piece of crap. I, I don't even, I mean, if I could get rid of it, I, 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 don't, I would. I mean, it's just terrible. I really think Apple would behoove themselves to do something like buy Pandora and Spotify and just roll up the business. And I know that I'm going to get a ton of criticism for this, but think about this. I, I posted the other day uh, a poll, should Apple buy Snapchat? My answer to that is I think that that would be a fantastic move for Apple. It would be expensive. They would have to overpay for it. But imagine them baking Snapchat into their onboard standard camera app that comes with the phone. They would be a huge social media player overnight. And I really believe that that bacon could give Instagram a run for their money. It would also stave off the, pro the, the impression that Apple is becoming a old, stodgy brand. They would be getting a lot of new, young kids. I mean, you look at who plays with, with Snapchat. It's all the, all the youth. I would say Apple should try to build their own. I've heard that, you know, why overpay for it? The answer is, is Apple has proven to be terrible at building these things. They can't even build a music app, and a lot of their business is based on music. They were the iPod company. That we saw the foray they put into maps, and now it's like, what, six years later? They're finally, like, maybe useful, and I still use Google Maps. I think Apple needs to buy some, some, some youth. And I really believe that, yeah, they have no social component. Look at Microsoft. They just bought LinkedIn. Um, I don't necessarily, I think Microsoft probably overpaid for LinkedIn. Um, I'm a little mixed, honestly, on that buy, if Microsoft buying LinkedIn is good or not. I th again, I think they overpaid, but it kind of solidifies Microsoft as being a, um, a business machine, right? They, they, Apple has always been seen as the more, you know, younger, not so professional brand, although I think it's really become now more, becoming more like that. But Windows has always been kind of what offices buy, and LinkedIn is sort of the offices of social media. So it makes a lot of sense to me that they bought them. 
Uh, I don't really know what that does so much, like how they're going to monetize that. Um, Microsoft, I mean, LinkedIn makes some good money, so I think that as a standalone, they're probably under a lot of less pressure, and they could probably do something like bundle LinkedIn, like you have, like to have a MSM, uh, not MSN, um, whatever, a, a, a um, Outlook account. Maybe you need to be on LinkedIn or something. I'm sure they'll do something like forcing it, you know, that way. Um, but I really do believe that Snapchat, and I, I, I would probably have not agreed with that, that statement a few months ago, but I see, I've been doing my work on Snapchat. I've been doing a little research on it. I've been futzing around with it myself and those um, overlays, you know, you stick out your tongue and the dog tongue comes out. Imagine that built into the Apple camera. I mean, it would be a really big killer app feature you know a lot of the reason i find that i upgrade my iphone every you know two years or whatever is because they build a better camera and there's always the back and forth who has the better camera android or apple and if they were to bake in snapchat into their camera it is game set match over over android they would pick up tremendous share it would be a it would be a game changer they should do that immediately um will they i don't know um, Tim Cook doesn't really seem to be all that adventurous, but I think that that would be a bold move for them. So that is the case that I've laid out here. So we'll see how that goes. Um, one more thing with that. I mean, we've seen what Instagram has done for Facebook. They can't get, you know, that was like the steal of a lifetime. I remember everyone accusing Zook of spending so much money on Facebook, on, on Instagram that it was a billion dollars. It's like valued at like 35 plus now. That's amazing. I mean, that that to me is really quite impressive. I think that'll go down as one of the big steals of the of the century. Um, Facebook has been outperforming Google because they are there's a move to mobile, and Facebook has been really the only one who's been able to monetize mobile. Um, speaking of Facebook, I'm diverting a little bit. Let's talk about their chart. So it's following the usual pattern here. Um, you run up. Go sideways for a while, then scare the bejesus out of everyone with a move back down, and then uh, rally up to new highs. So I think that that's probably going to be the case here. It below 116 remains a little bit vulnerable. This is now three days closing below the 50 MA. Um, it I don't necessarily know if this is going to be an easy gap fill because it's in a bit of a channel here. But I would be a buyer somewhere between the gap fill and the 200 MA. So somewhere between like 108.90 and 105, it's 105.74 and rising. That's also a channel low. The 200 MA, um, all of the MAs have offered support recently. The 50 did not. The 100 is also kind of an important one. It held it the last time, so we'll see how that goes. And then, you know, the 200 has been like rock solid support with, you know, maybe small violations below. Um, so if there was a 200 MA gap fill and channel um, support that came into confluence, I would be a buyer of that in size. Um, I like put ratios for this. Um, the problem with getting filled is the IV isn't that high, so there's really not that much to do. If you want to do just outright spreads, particularly if you're longer term bullish and you want it to be a hedge, I think that that is a really good um, alternative. Twitter, um, someone had asked me about that. I I guess I'll mention it. I I talked about it was on um, 524. I forget who did the downgrade that day, but it was like you're downgrading a stock on the dead lows. I said that it didn't go lower, and a move over the high a day would be a long. I, I still think that the stock can potentially go higher. There's been a lot of speculation about whether this um, is going to be a takeout or whatever. I'll tell you, honestly, this is one of the most poorly managed companies I've ever seen. They have an amazing product. I, I'm a huge fan. It's actually my, uh, I think it's my favorite social media outlet. Um, but I, I talk to my friends who aren't traders or whatever, and they don't know how to use the damn thing. They don't, when, I remember when I first had it, I didn't know how to use it either. I basically used it as a way to upload to Facebook and to other social media because you were at the time able to use it. Um, I mean, you could do this now with Instagram or whatever. And I've said for a while, Twitter should become more Instagram-like, which they have not, although they seem to be making some moves. They're just moving really slowly. They were more interested in getting a diversity director. Now they're investing in SoundCloud. I mean, it just seems like a company that really has lost its way. 
I think Jack Dorsey's a really, really smart guy. Um, out by me in Williamsburg and Brooklyn, everyone, all these stores around here have the square, um, you know, checkout. I, I just don't understand what they're doing with Twitter. Why are they still including hyperlink? I mean, they announced the other day that they're not going to include the hyperlink or the um, at, you know, at who, so-and-so in, as a character count. Why is it still not launched? I mean, I don't understand. They make the announcement, and, it, and it's taking this long to not, to not count it? I mean, that's, that's like a no-brainer. I mean, how long did it take for them to build in Periscope to, um, to Twitter? It's just, it's ridiculous. I don't understand what is taking so long. They, I think that they just, it's just a company that it, it's very disorganized. It's not very, it's not very well run. So eventually, if this gets cheap enough and, you know, they have a lot of cash on balance sheet, it's not really an expensive company anymore like it was back up in the 40s and 50s. But um, eventually this might get bought. I just don't know that it won't be single digits before that happens. Um, it seems to be in a little bit of an upswing here, filling the gap a bit, but I have a f feeling um, it's just going to be one of these kind of sideways situations. Um, I don't know who would buy them out. I think a media outlet would be good. Um, I actually, believe it or not, think that that would be a good... I, w I would think that that would be also a good ac acquisition for Apple because they've had a lot of... Um, they've had a long-term kind of relationship with Twitter. It was the first social media built in like to their apps. So, um, I mean, their widgets and so on and so forth. So I, I think that that would be good for them, particularly with like newsstand and stuff, if they want to become more of a media outlet, which I actually, another thing I think Apple should do um, to kind of combat Facebook. Facebook is very quickly becoming the number one media outlet in the world. Um, I know when I, when I want my news, I've been more and more getting it from Twitter and from Facebook, pretty much almost exclusively. So... You know, all of you subscribe to the publications on there. You follow their feeds, and you get you know notifications. It's it's fantastic. So Apple really needs to get into that mix, and I think Twitter might be a good idea for them to um, to do. The only problem I have is, like I said, Apple is not the best at creating software. They make the best hardware, but they don't make the best software. I don't know who they would bring in. Maybe they buy Snapchat and let the Snapchat guys revamp Twitter. That would be freaking amazing. Um, there you go. That would be the way to, that would be the way to do it, I think. Um, yeah. All right. So I don't want to get too out there with who should be buying who. I have a couple of more, um, marriages, um, shotgun marriages that I think would be interesting. But, um, let's get into the, um, let's get into the real, the big boy here, Spy. And I will finish off, um, I think we'll end there. So I posted a tweet yesterday. Um, what was the exact words? Here it is. Somebody retweeted it. That was very nice of them. If SPY repairs today's um, poor lows first, she should rally on the Fed. If she rallies early without repair, then sell-off is more likely IMHO. Um, that's exactly what happened. You had early rally, poor highs. You had a bit of a liquidation break, a rally back up to the highs. Um, you had a move today that kind of repaired today's highs, but it was only on the Fed spike. I'm not really sure how much that counts, believe it or not. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out in the next, like, day or two. I know SPY, it basically closed around the 50 MA today. You had a look above the 208.97 and fail, not great. You closed below um, some bodies. You're basically hovering right above the 50% Fib of the move. The problem is, is we didn't repair um, yesterday's poor lows, and I have a bit of a rule of thumb. If you're above a Fed high of day, it's a long, and if you're below the low of day, it's a short. So I don't necessarily know if a repair of the lows, like if it would have happened early today, I don't know if it happens like, let's say, next week or tomorrow, it will be enough to stop the move. Um, I'm still not going to be totally um, bearish on the market unless we start cracking the 206 half to 20676, which is the 61.8 and a key rate of reference level I have there. But it's hard for me to be super duper bullish until we clear the 20897 and then today's high of day, which was 20936. If we do clear that, I think that we will go significantly higher, back to the high, and make a new all-time high. So I did a little bit of math. I know um, a lot of you like when I talk about what the expected move is in the SPY. 
Um, so I not only have those numbers, but I have the calculations about where that would end up. So the expected move into the end of this week, and I want to just caveat that I don't know how terrible this week it could be because the SPY goes ex-dividend on Friday, and if you're short, you have to pay that. It's like a dollar five, I believe. I would think that if the people were going to start their short, it would probably be after it goes X, which would be Monday. So we might not get really resolution on this until next week. Um, we also have an options roll. I think it's a, is it a, qu a triple or a quad which? If someone could just type that in there. Um, it's a big options expiration. Um, it's also a quarterly options expiration, which is, yeah, tri oh, someone say three, someone said four. I think it is a quad which, actually, which is very volatile. It doesn't surprise me that there was a bit of a roll. I, again, I think more next week is where we're going to really get some answers about what's going on here. Um, I will say this, that the fact that Yellen is dovish has me not thinking t terribly bearish, but I don't love that. Um, I, I'm not going to be super bullish unless, like I said, the 208.97 to 209.36. We've got to take out that high a day, and then I think it's off to the races again. Um, all right, so the calculations. The expected move into expiration this Friday is... The Brexit vote, I believe, by the way, is next Thursday. Someone, I think it's the 23rd. If I'm wrong, somebody please correct me. I love the chat here that I could be corrected. I believe it's next Thursday. Um, the expected move into this Friday is $2.34, which would, drum roll please, take us up to 210.10, roughly, which has been the big uh, number. We've pinned 210 the last two Fridays. Three times the charm, maybe. Um, if we go down, it would be 205.41. That isn't quite... It's close to the channel low. So that makes a little bit of sense. It's also close to the 78.6, um, which is um, 204.86. So we're, it would be w roughly within that range. It would also be a gap fill. They, um, the gap fill is exactly to 205.21, so it's close enough for government work, as they say. Um, next week, the expected move is $5.85. That's a lot of Brexit fear built in. Um, the number one play next week could be just shorting volatility. We'll get into that in the weekend review video. Alrighty, uh, th that move, w if it was from here, would take us up to 213.60, which is just above the highs. And oddly, on the move lower, which is a little weird, although it's usually like this, would take you to the range low of 201.90. That is a big level I have marked out on my, um, on my chart. It would be... It would be roughly close... I mean, it's obviously would undercut the last swing low, but that to me would start setting up a larger head and shoulders pattern. I don't want to get ahead of myself. That is a big stretch at the moment. I will discuss it in the Sunday video, um, which I think would be interesting for people. I'm not really crazy bearish, though, because, first of all, there are a lot of people on the stream who are bearish. I want to just point out, and on TV, I just want to point something out. These are the same people that were bearish pre the last head and shoulders setup, during the head and shoulders setup, and even after it failed. They have been just perma bears. So the feel, though, on the, on the tape, in my view, on Twitter, though, has been getting increasingly more bearish the last few days. Even in the run-up, I would say there was a little bit of complacency. I was a little concerned. I did a poll that I asked if people, um, I don't remember what the exact results were, but it was roughly 70-30. People thought today was going to be up. That, to me, was also confirmation that we were probably going to be down a little bit, um, given that and the earlier poor highs and the fact that we were up early. When you rally into a Fed, it usually winds up with a break. If you're down and people are nervous, it winds up rallying back up. I think that there's still a little bit of optimism in a few people who I want to see kind of cave. My fa I don't talk about it, but I have a fade list. I need a, to see a couple of more people squeak, so to speak. It hasn't happened yet. But um, let's just keep it really simple, stupid. Use today's high of day. Above that, we get more bullish. If we get below the low of day, there's probably going to be some more pullback to repair those poor lows um, and get to the 61.8. Um, I'll take it from there. I just like to take it from level to level. I'll have more info, I think, after we see the um, close on Friday for the weekend review. I don't like to. I, I do have some more technical analysis I could do on this, but I can't show you my chart, and I 
don't want to do that to you guys because it's really a little bit of matrix like kung fu here um, with with some of the with some of the levels and where you know things I, I feel like if you don't have your finger on the button and keyed up with your order you might not be able to benefit from it keep it simple above the low above the high today long in the range just no touch below you can try right or right or right or right out short with a stop above today's I wouldn't say you have to go all the way to the high but you could use the body of today's range so if you were to get above the 208.54 ish let me see what's this high here um, yeah actually there's another high um, but that was the oddly enough that was the high of the failed right shoulder so I like that level um, if you want to play short, you can use 20. If you want to be row row short, 20854. Below, you can play short above uh, the GTFO, and I'll leave it on that. Wow, that was. Um, it always seems to work out like that with my levels. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you missed this or want to watch the rebroadcast, I will upload it to my YouTube channel now. That is Justin Pulitzer Trades. Anyway, um, stay tuned for Sunday's video. I, I will see you on Sunday. Uh, cheers.